Hello there, folks. We are talking about social construction and policy narrative framework this week. And this uh, is one of my favorite areas of policy study, so I hope that you enjoy it as well. What these um, theories of policy design focus on is this fundamental question of whether there can be a truly objective policy design. And people who study using narrative policy framework and social construction say that we actually cannot make policy in an objective way. Instead, we have a series of subjective choices that are made that are subject to people's values at any given point in time. And language is then used to justify, rationalize, normalize, just really ingrain those values until they become behaviors and policy choices. So the answer, um, the question, the answer to the following question is very value driven. And that question seems quite simple, but it's actually quite profound. And that is, what does the world look like? And what should the world look like? So social construction, broadly speaking, and I'll let the reading fill in the gaps a little bit, but social construction um, focuses on the ways in which people, places, things, everything around us has a social meaning, right? We give it meaning, uh, we give it meaning, and we have meanings that people agree on and meanings that people don't agree on. These might be images or stereotypes that are true and untrue, um, but they are meanings nonetheless. So these definitions can be made deliberately, um, or they can they can be made over time, um, and just kind of uh, come together more naturally or organically. And within this, symbols are very powerful ways to tell stories. So the symbol you see here, the recycling symbol, right, that tells a story all on its own, um, and people have very different reactions to this symbol. Um, even though it's something as mundane as here's where you can throw your plastic bottle, people's feelings about recycling can reflect their political values, their socioeconomic class, the way that they were brought up and socialized, things like that. And so between symbols and metaphors, we can describe a lot of the world around us. Metaphors are ways that we can describe a problem by likening it to another problem, right? We can describe um, the opioid crisis as an um, epidemic, right? And we can say this is how you have to treat an epidemic. Um, and so if A is like B, then you want to do X, which is like Y to solve B, right? Um, so common metaphors, wedges, inclines, slippery slopes, right? Change of scale, containment of the problem itself can be a metaphor. The disease metaphor, as I talked about with the opioid crisis being um, labeled as an epidemic, even though it's not a contagious disease, um, or industries being labeled as dying industries, right? So names and labels of how we specify programs or partnerships or collaborations matter as well. What we are building up to are full-blown narratives. Narratives um, are the stories that help us define and contest the policy choices that get made. So I have a picture of a turtle here, and you're probably wondering why. Um, I didn't want to put, put up the more hor horrific looking picture or video, but if you remember about a year ago, there was a video that went viral with a turtle um, that had a straw stuck in its nose, a sea turtle. And pretty much overnight, everybody moved away from plastic straws. But that was a policy narrative. Nothing had changed, right? Nothing had fundamentally changed in the facts on the ground. And we chose to put that burden on individuals um, to make that choice. And sometimes we didn't think about unintended consequences, like people with disabilities or children or what have you. Um, so the, prob the way in which we define the problem and the way in which we define potential solutions typically has a beginning, middle, and end. So if we think about the turtles and the straw, we see the horrific video, we change our ways about how we act, you know, we request strawless beverages from here on out, we use more reusable uh, resources, and everybody's better for it. There are plot points, there are characters, there are people who are being deviant and not doing it. 
this one right here, um, and, and so on, right? But that narrative can change quickly, right? Because what if you, if you've been to a Starbucks drive through if you can find one that's open right now, you'll notice that they're not using reusable containers anymore. They're giving out straws, they're giving out disposable containers, because they are now concerned about something else, which is a disease, a contagious disease. So the narrative shifts again. These narratives help us make sense of the world and of our policy problems role in the world. So narrative stories can follow different paths, and there are some kind of key ones to, to really think about here. One of them uh, is the idea of stories about change. How do you show change um, and how that might help suit your policy goals differs from problem to problem. You might have stories of decline. Both of these photos here, by the way, are, in, are of Flint, Michigan. The first is, is a photo of an abandoned house that's boarded up. It dictates to you without knowing much that it's a story of decline, right? This looks like it, at one time it was a fairly nice home, um, likely in a fairly nice neighborhood that is no longer nice. And we can have anecdotes about neighborhoods like this across the board. And in fact, we have a lot of statistics about it as well. I can, you know, pull up right alongside of it stories about statistics about how many houses are abandoned or how many houses per uh, square mile are abandoned and so on. But we also portray stories of rising when we want to. So the Flint Farmer's Market is a great story of rising, right? It's a repurposed building that has been given new life and really has become a hub of the community. The problems with these stories, though, to describe problems or policies or any of these things, um, is that change can be temporary, right? So the images can be selected and highlight only a portion of what is going on and not looking at everything in context. And policy entrepreneurs know this and they use these symbols um, quite often because of that. So it might appear that things are improving or um, or are not improving when they, you know, when the opposite is true. So narrative stories can also be stories about power and how we choose to use it. So they can be about the politics surrounding who gets certain types of benefits and so on. And in part of this, this search for for power or this uh, way in which we order the world. Conspiracy theories often take root um, when stories about power because conspiracy theories are often about unexplained phenomenon that we um, can't grapple with um, without some sort of ambiguity. And the human mind does not like ambiguity, so we fill it in with a story, right? Autism is something to many people that is scary and unknown and they don't know how to deal with it. And they happen to notice an onset that happens after a vaccine is delivered. Um, and so there's a link that's drawn and conspiracy theories grow. When things are difficult to understand, conspiracy theories help fill in the gaps and create a power-driven story that something was done deliberately or knowingly to cause or evoke horror. Power stories can also be used to blame. And the, the typical one here is, is the welfare queen, which you see a, a comic on the screen of, of that type of situation. Someone who is undeserving of the policy benefit they're being given um, because they don't use it in a way that has been socially deemed uh, appropriate. So we want to create policy then to shape one individual's behavior by making them compliant. These are all stories of power that have real consequences when it comes to policy. So one of the ways in which this initially came up was by a um, public policy expert named Deborah Stone, who wrote a book called The Public or The Policy Paradox. And part of the problem with a lot of policy theories to this point was that they tried to use a lot of market settings to see how policy would work, a lot of cost-benefit analysis type of things. But what Stone said is that public policy cannot be analyzed in this way. It is too ambiguous. There are too many directions things could go in. And she laid out two premises about public policy that make this so. The first is that economic frameworks that are rooted in rational choice theory, people being able to weigh costs and benefits because they have full information, those stories are insufficient 
for evaluating public policy. They just don't give us enough information. And the second thing is that society should be viewed through the lens of what she calls the polis or the people rather than the market because we're not talking about the market and the same forces do not apply. So policymaking then is a struggle over ideas, not just outcomes, but of ideas. Whose ideas are the dominant ones at the end of the day? So unlike the market, um, public policy making is very irrational, right? You can't say people weighed cost and benefits and made a choice because choices don't often follow the cost benefit analysis. It's very irrational at certain stages, even though there might be rationality at others. One of the ways in which this irrationally shows, uh, irrationality shows itself is through the social construction of target populations. When a policy is set out, there is usually a population that is going to benefit over others. And how we characterize that group of people really does matter in terms of the type of policy, how well it's received, and how it works. So Stone argues that policy design is based largely on how we categorize things, right? And one of the types of things we categorize are people. Um, it, we deem people to be legitimate and illegitimate all the time based on what they do or who they are. Now another addition to this was Schneider and Ingram's um, categorization of people based on policy. In other words, that people's place in the world with respect to the policy drives the policy choices. So this is the chart here, and I want to make sure I reference my notes so I don't forget anything. Um, but essentially, where a target category falls in this, um, in this dynamic here shapes the policy. So we can think of um, two dynamics that are going on here. One is how much someone deserves public policy attention, right? So the people over here deserve it, the people over here maybe not, and how much political power that uh, group has, right? The people up here have more political power, the people up here do not. So let's talk about it. Advantage groups include, include people like scientists, business owners, senior citizens, middle class taxpayers, the military, the people that you just can't insult and win an election, right? And Advantage groups tend to be targets for wide distribution. We want, as policymakers, we want to give a lot to advantage groups because it, it goes in our favor politically, and we also want to minimize the costs associated with those policies. Sometimes that means we put them on disfavored groups, and sometimes that just means we hide the costs altogether. Now, contenders, like advantage groups, are generally groups that have a lot of political power, but they're not seen as necessarily as deserving. So we think of uh, labor unions, gun owners, insurance industry, any kind of lobbying group that we tend to think about right off the bat that might fall into the contenders here. And contenders tend to receive policy benefits, but they're not as explicit as those that the advantaged um, policy groups get because policymakers know they can't just outright give them things. They have to hide them and be a little more discreet about it. So they will loudly talk about when they put costs on them, but not talk about when they put benefits on them. That shapes the type of policy you might see when the group we're talking about are, are one of these contenders. Dependence down here in the lower uh, left quadrant. Um, dependents are those groups that lack political power but are generally thought of positively. Uh, mothers, children, students, uh, the disabled generally are thought of as dependents because they are deserving but they don't have a lot of political power. Um, they lack political power and are seen as deserving, and so the benefits tend to be more explicit than those certainly given to deviants, but maybe even contenders. We want to say we're helping the poor. We want to say we're helping mothers, etc. But they're not as maximized as the advantage because they don't have the political power to drive the policy mechanisms in place. And then finally, we have the deviants, criminals. Um, terrorists, gangs, uh, certainly in this um, day and age, um, undocumented immigrants are thought of in this classification. Um, deviants lack political power and they lack a kind of positive framing in the mainstream. Thus, they are 
both politically weak and we don't want to have policies that help them. In fact, a lot of times we want to have policies that outright hurt them because politically speaking, that benefits the policymakers' goals. So what this does is it helps show us how constructing a group can help contribute to how a policy is constructed. So narrative policy framework then takes all of this and says we can actually measure how this is being done. We can empirically test elements of the narratives and the surrounding policies to find patterns. And we can show that these stories, these symbols, these frameworks um, can be quantified in a way to offer insight as to how policy changes. And often we think about the way in which policy change often accompanies a shift in how a policy is framed. So instead of um, a policy being framed as special rights, like same-sex marriage, if it's thought of as a civil right, does that shift people's perception of the policy? We can think of this at different levels, the micro being an individual level, the meso being a substructure level. So remember before when we were talking about policy substructures and coordinated groups, that would be the meso level, and the macro level about how that ultimately results in policy outputs. Narrative policy framework has gained a lot of ground, and your readings are not shy about pointing that out. Um, one of the reasons why is it's empirical and so data can be used, um, and that tends to legitimize theories fairly quickly. Another is that it can be linked very closely to political psychology, which is a longstanding um, subsection of political science. And we can look at things like how narratives change opinions, how framing effects work, and things of that nature. So there's a lot of empirical study that can be done here um, to look at why policy acts the way it does or sh is shaped the way it is. So the discussion question this week in the discussion circles, we are still, this is our last week focusing on gun violence. If you were to think about the gun violence narratives over the past five years, how would you tell that story, right? If you were to tell that story in a couple of paragraphs, how would you tell that story? What are the plot elements? Who are the characters? What types of symbols are being used? Um, you know, is there a good guy and a bad guy? Or is there, or is there an anti-hero, perhaps? How are they discussed and how are they used to make policy, right? So think about it, deconstruct it a little, and, and see what you come up with. And I, I can't wait to see what that looks like. All right, that's all for this week. I will talk to you soon.